show the person speaking rather than the entirety of the committee. And again, screenshots or taking photos of your screen are not permitted either. Um, colleagues, we, pursuant to Standing Order 108-2 and the motion adopted by the committee on Wednesday, October 5th, 2022, the committee is resuming its study of food price inflation. Uh, this being International Women's Day and, uh, of course, uh, this being a committee of interest given the topic of food and food inflation, uh, I do want to recognize, uh, I believe she might be now the past president of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, uh, but we have Mary Robinson, uh, who has served in that capacity, who's joining us here. Uh, this being International Women's Day to you, Mary, and to, indeed, other female leaders in the agriculture community, thank you so much uh, for all your work on behalf of Canadians. I'd now like to welcome our witnesses. So with us today in the room from Empire Company Limited, Michael Medline, who serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer. From Loblaws Companies Limited, we have Galen Weston, the Chairman and President. And joining us online uh, via virtual conference, we have Eric Lathresh, uh, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer. So the way that today's proceedings will take place, we are going to allow to up to five minutes for opening remarks from each of the witnesses, uh, and then we are going to turn it over to questions. Uh, colleagues, for your benefit, I intend to go about an hour and 20 minutes, three rounds of questions, uh, and then we have some other additional committee work that we need to carry on with. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, our first witness, Mr. Medline. You have up to five minutes. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the leader of a proudly Nova Scotia-born business that employs 130,000 people across Canada, I want to start by acknowledging the challenges that families in Canada are facing every day to make ends meet. Canadians are facing the highest cost of living increase in four decades. Interest rates have been rising steeply and prices on all goods and services have been rapidly increasing. It is no solace to struggling Canadians buying groceries to know that food inflation is a global phenomenon driven by higher commodity and input costs, or to know that food inflation in Canada is actually lower than many other G20 countries, including the US, the UK, and Mexico. Several factors have contributed to the high food inflation Canadians are experiencing, including geopolitical events, product input costs, extreme weather, soaring energy costs, and labour shortages. At Empire, I can assure you that we are doing everything we can to contain price increases and provide value to our customers during these trying times. And we're doing it on paper-thin profit margins of 2.5%. We believe we are seeing indications of inflation peaking and then abating this spring. But this is not an immediate salve, I know, for the many Canadians struggling financially. I'd like to make three main points today. First. I stand by everything shared with you in December by our Chief Operating Officer, Pierre Saint Laurent. Most notably, we at Empire are not profiting from inflation. It doesn't matter how many times you say it, write it, or tweet it. It is simply not true. The truth is we are at the end of a very long food supply chain that has economic inputs at every step and stage. We detest the decisions inflation is forcing Canadian families to make and that we see in our stores each and every day. We see customers buying fewer items and trading down. Second, as a grocery retailer, we have been pay playing a major role in trying to minimize food price inflation, and we will continue fighting for our customers. Since inflation took off, we have been battling inflationary pressures in our business, including rising costs in products, fuel, labour, energy, and construction. So far, in 2023 alone, we are seeing the same volume of cost increase requests from the supplier community, with a slight indication that the requests are slowing this April. I am not going to throw our supplier partners under the bus. They are also doing their best in extraordinary times. They are greatly impacted by rising costs, which unfortunately they are forced to pass on to retailers. Many of our supplier partners are also dealing with the downstream cost impacts resulting from cost increases on supply chain control com commodities like milk. We know groups like the Dairy Commission are facing the same realities that we are with their input costs. We're also heavily investing in our promotional offerings and flyer deals, expanding our private label value options and making shifts in pack sizes to provide Canadian consumers 
with more value during these difficult times. The third point I'd like to make is that there are ways government and business can work together, together, to ultimately reduce prices. Empire is happy to partner with government on solutions to fight inflation. Government and business have a collective role to play to contain inflation, but I will list five specific examples here, as I know the intention of this committee is to gather research and ideas to alleviate the pressure of food prices on Canadians. First, implement a strong grocery supply code of uh, practice. We were the first major grocer to support this initiative and we continue to be an ardent adv advocate of a code of conduct to ensure fair practices for all participants in our food supply chain. Second, reduce congestion at Canadian ports and simplify the flow of goods across borders. Third, create better economic conditions for mu food manufacturers and growers to stay in Canada as so many are fleeing to the U.S. Four, invest in greenhouse farming. We must find a way to reduce our reliance on American fresh foods to shorten the supply chain and lower cost to Canadians. Fifth, do everything possible to strengthen the Canadian dollar. Of course, you will have to ensure this doesn't injure other parts of the economy, but it's critical in terms of food pricing. We would also ask that you look at the entire industry to consider solutions. There are giant American grocery retailers doing business in Canada who were not called to the floor here today. Are they exempt from playing a role in these issues? We are a proud Canadian company with 115 years of experience serving the needs of Canadian families. We have transformed to become a much healthier business than we were just six years ago, something that all Canadians benefit from. It is folly to suggest that an unprofitable grocery business is somehow better for customers and better for shelf prices. Canada needs and relies on a healthy grocery industry. Like all Canadians, we look forward to seeing the end of this tough inflationary period. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Medline. We'll now turn to Mr. Weston for up to five minutes, please. Bonjour, and thank you, Chair and Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to sit before you today. The world is in the midst of a cost of living crisis. For 18 months, this has affected just about everything. Global food prices have risen quickly, putting significant strain on Canadian families, both in terms of their finances and overall health. It's a vitally important issue for Canadians and deserves the attention of this committee. For months, a great deal has been said about the role Canadian grocers play in food price inflation, many directly blaming us. This is understandable, but inaccurate. Here's why. First, food inflation is affecting every country, not just us here in Canada. And I know it doesn't feel like it, but Canada has one of the lowest food inflation rates in the world. Second, as unexpected as it may sound, grocery chains operate with extremely small profit margins, which means we have minimal influence on inflation. On a customer's $25 grocery basket, we earn just $1 in profit. That means even if the industry had zero profits, a $25 grocery bill would still cost $24. So the claim that Canadian grocers can correct food price inflation is simply wrong. Third, for those who say grocers are profiteering, the math just doesn't add up. Since inflation took off 18 months ago, the cost of that $25 grocery basket has increased just under $4. During that same period, the grocer's profit increased by 15 cents. In other words, food prices have increased 25 times faster than profits. And at Loblaw, none of those profits came from higher food margins. Our retail prices have not risen faster than our costs. So no matter how many times you read it on Twitter, the idea that grocers are causing food inflation is not only false, it's impossible. Fourth, and finally, we are actively working to keep inflation down. We stopped $500 million in unjustified cost increases last year. We welcomed half a million more customers to our discount no, frill, no frills and maxi stores where shoppers save about 10% or $1 billion compared to traditional supermarkets. Our price freeze saved customers real money and millions of Canadians continue to save 25% by switching to no name. 
we are actively lowering prices on key essentials, losing money selling many of them. Last week, a customer stopped and challenged me in the grocery aisle. She said, if we were truly doing all these things, why is our profit increasing at all? It's a fair question. The biggest reason is that Loblaw is much more than a grocer. Non-grocery products like financial services, apparel, and importantly, Shoppers Drug Mart, make up more than half our business. We've been clear. It's the efficiency of our business and the strength of categories like cosmetics, even cough and cold, that have been driving our growth, not food. These are facts. We've explained them in our public disclosures, and they are formally audited by an independent third party. That does not change the underlying challenge. And while I believe food inflation will normalize, there are still far too many Canadians facing food insecurity. We think about this a great deal, and I challenge our team on whether we're doing enough to change that. Last year, Loblaw dramatically expanded our relationship with the country's largest food banks. Through our work with Second Harvest, over 1,100 of our stores now have a direct link to a local food charity. Last year, we donated over 5 million kilograms of food. We've rapidly expanded our partnership with an amazing Canadian startup called Flash Foods that uses an app to make perishable food like meat and produce available at 50% off. It's now available at over 500 stores. And our President's Choice Children's Charity continues to lead the country in providing healthy snacks and meals to school children. At 123 million meals, we're well on our way to our target of reliably feeding 1 million children a year. Is that a lot of food? Yes. Is it meaningful? For many, it's transformational. But is it enough? No. The job won't be done until everyone has real food security. I'm proud to lead a, com a company that partners with over 1,500 small business owners. Together, we employ over 200,000 people, united in the purpose of helping Canadians live life well. This is a responsibility we take deeply to heart. But solving food insecurity is not within the reach of one company or one industry alone. It requires all of us, retailers, manufacturers, growers, government, community leaders, and NGOs, all working together. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Weston. Et maintenant, nous... And now we will turn to Mr. Lafleche. You have five minutes, sir. The floor is yours. Your microphone is not turned on, sir. Hello. We know that Canadian families are in difficulty as they've been struggling with high inflation, including food price inflation, for almost a year. That's why at Metro, our teams are working hard to provide the best possible value to the people and families that we serve every day under all our banners, thanks to our competitive prices, our private banner marks, and our weekly specials. As parliamentarians, you have a role to play in understanding the real causes of inflation and in working with our sector to find ways to alleviate supply challenges. More than ever, we do need to work together to find solutions to the cost of living crisis for Canadians. This period of high inflation is a global reality, yet Canada is faring better than most of the G7 countries. Despite this, there's no doubt that food prices here have risen due to rising supplier and producer costs. As confirmed in a recent Statistics Canada report, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, adverse weather conditions and transportation and labour issues are among many factors that have contributed to higher food prices. These factors have led to an unprecedented number of price increases from our suppliers. In 2022, Metro received more than 27,000 price increase requests, averaging more than 10% from grocery suppliers alone, that's nearly three times our annual average. This year, we continue to receive a large number of price increase requests from our suppliers. Our teams handle these requests responsibly, negotiating firmly, fairly, 
and transparently to minimize impacts on our customers. However, it's important to keep in mind that our retail prices do not reflect the full effect of inflation because we too have absorbed some of the cost increases. Metro is a business, a private company. In an open, highly competitive market, we compete for customers, talent and capital with both Canadian companies and U.S. giants such as Costco, Walmart and Amazon that represent a significant portion of the market. I note that these U.S. companies were not invited to participate in the committee's work. Suggestions that were somehow causing food inflation, using food inflation to inflate our profit margins, are not paying our fair share of taxes, are simply untrue. As we report publicly every quarter, our profit margins have remained stable for years. Since the beginning of our 2022 fiscal year, our food profit margin has actually decreased, though it's been offset by a higher pharmacy products profit margin. Let me stress that no one at Metro wants to continue operating in a high inflation environment. We would like to see inflation return to normal levels, as that's best for our customers and for our business as well. In the meantime, we'll continue to provide the best value to our customers that we can at all of our banners through our competitive pricing, full range of private products and effective weekly promotions. Trust in our company is driven by our loyal and growing customer base who demonstrate this trust every day through their hundreds of thousands of transactions with us. In closing, I hope all members of the committee recognize that the entire supply chain is under an unprecedented period of prolonged stress focusing on grocers will not solve the problem of food inflation because we're not causing it and we're not benefiting from it. As I said at the outset, we must work together to find solutions to the cost of living crisis faced by Canadians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lafleche. And now, we will have a chance to speak further through questions and answers. As, uh, as parliamentarians, I'm glad we are studying this issue. Uh, it is a top of mind issue for all Canadians. It's an emotional one. Uh, and one thing I think this committee does very well is uh, we are principled in our ask of trying to get to the bottom of the facts. I would ask that you're principled and uh, uh, tough with your questions today, uh, but it is my job to make sure that we maintain integrity. So please uh, be mindful of that in your interventions uh, with our witnesses here today. And with that, I will start with Ms. Rood for up to six minutes. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, witnesses, for being here today. You as the CEOs of major grocery chains have an oligopoly with it, only five companies controlling 80% of grocery stores in Canada. And you use this power to nickel and dime farmers and wholesalers to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars for many, with fines, chargebacks and exorbitant fees for the privilege of selling their food to your stores, forcing them to accept contracts where according to the fruit and vegetable growers of Canada, 44% of producers are selling at a loss. And the world is worried about food security right now, and Canada has an abundance of land to grow fresh food to feed the world. But your company's practices of arbitrary fees, fines, and chargebacks are keeping your profits and grocery prices high, while single-handedly helping to destroy Canadian family produce farms and businesses. And nowhere else in the world do grocers do this to farmers and producers. A farmer should not have to be an accountant to read their statements after selling to you. Prices are quickly becoming unreachable for roughly 12.5 million Canadians who are earning less than $40,000 a year, forcing them to switch to, from fresh, healthy food to heavily processed, cheaper and less nutritious products. And that's not real food, and it's going to lead to an increase in the burden on our health care system. Canadians deserve to eat fresh, Canadian-grown fruits and vegetables, and we cannot rely on foreign countries to feed us. Foreign growers don't operate under the same high standards as our farmers here in Canada. And as someone who's been in the produce business, it's concerning knowing that the prices in store are inflated far beyond the costs of what a farmer is being paid to grow and then deliver to your distribution centres. And after eight years 
uh, under a government that's purposefully implementing taxes and policies that are harmful to Canada's agriculture industry. What your businesses are doing to farmers doesn't give a lot of hope to the average person who's simply looking to eat. And farmers' selling prices are going down while grocers are piling on fees and penalties and consumer prices are going up in stores. So, um, gentlemen, I'd like to ask you, can you look farm families in the eyes right now? Because I know a lot of them are watching right now and tell them that you're not pushing family produce farms out of business in this country. And are you even aware that 44% of farmers are selling at a loss in this country to you? Um, knowing this... My question is simple. Will you, once and for all, abolish all fees, fines, and chargebacks and actually pay farmers the price that's on their invoice? So yes or no? I can start with you, Mr. Medline. Well, first of all, thank you. I'm not good at yes and no, I'm going to warn you. Um, you sure. I'm going you to try to keep it. I'm going to do so. And, but by the way, I appreci really appreciate your passion, Ms. Rood. And this is not just for today. I've, I've read transcripts and I've seen what you've had to say before on behalf of farmers, and I, I love it. Um, if I may, I'm going to try to do it real quick, uh, Mr. Chair, but uh, there are a few things I wanted to say here. First on the question of oligopoly, okay? The top three grocers in Canada have about a 47% share of the food retail market, not the 67 that's reported in some other places where they mix some things up. So I just want to get that straight. And this is not out of line with countries around the world. And we compete against some of the toughest food retailers in the world, including Walmart, Amazon, and Costco, as well as a lot of other competition. That does not sound like an oligopoly to me. And how do you account for the fact that Canada's food inflation is below many other countries? This is not a problem of too little competition. The problem uh, is that there is a global product cost inflation. Having said that, I think there's a lot we can do to protect our supplier partners who deal with the farmers. Uh, I've been an advocate, as, as you have, Ms. Rood, October 28th, 2020, I called for a code of conduct. On November 4th, you second that, seconded that and said this would be a great thing. We're still waiting for a code of conduct, um, which will get rid of unfair fees, which will help um, the supplier partners. Uh, it'll create more efficiencies and should bring down over some time the cost of food a little bit. Thank and you. That so would really you committed help. to and a, I, a grocery and I love local. Sorry, I have to interject yeah, here. I'm sorry, Mr. Redline. I only ahead, have another minute and a half left here. Oh, Ms. I'm sorry. Mr. Weston, will you commit to the grocery code of conduct like Mr. Medline has with Empire? So we're active participants uh, in the development of the, of the code of conduct. And let me just add, you know, a healthy supplier community, a healthy grower community is absolutely vital to our industry. We work hard every day to support local producers. And you, you do get, uh, you know, there are concerned um, uh, pr producers. And there are also those who write to me and they say that our business has been transformational uh, in terms of expanding their access to new markets um, and new products, uh, you know, that are being sold all across, all across the country. We also have to strike the right balance between, um, you know, between what we pay our, our growers, what we pay our suppliers, and ultimately, uh, you know, the food prices that, what, that we charge our customers. Our job is to negotiate the best possible price um, and then to pass that, uh, you know, pass that through to consumers. So we do our very, very best um, you know, to strike the right balance. We have a very sophisticated um, process that we use to assess whether cost of goods increases are justified or unjustified. We push back on those that we believe are opportunistic and we fully accept uh, and push through those that are are credible and realistic. Um, and so Respectfully, sorry, sir, I only have 20 seconds left. Okay. I have one more quick question, but I would challenge you all to do better for farmers because we don't want to see our family produce farms go out of business in this country. And because of the fees that they pay you, that is the number one contributing factor to them going out of business. But my quick question is, will you uh, it support and participate following any adjudicated disputes under the code? Will you commit to a fully transparent and publicly available disclosure? It's a quick yes or no. We're certainly committed to developing an effective code that's fair and balanced on all sides. Mr. Medline? Yeah, you know where I stand on this, Ms. Rood. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. LaFleche, I didn't get to you. Okay, well, we'll certainly have more opportunity for questions uh, where you get a number of rounds here. We're going to turn to Mr. Turnbull for up to six minutes. Over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, just before I get started, I just wanted to share a general sentiment and agreement that I think we should be inviting Walmart and Costco as part of this study as witnesses as well. I think that's only fair. Um, so, 
thanks for being here to the witnesses. Uh, every day we are hearing from constituents who are struggling with the prices they're paying for essential food items at the stores of Canada's grocery giants. And Canadians understand very well that inflation is a complex global issue. However, in the wake of the bread price fixing scandal, a cloud of doubt lingers over food retailers and their claims to be good corporate citizens. And Canadians are rightly vocalizing their concerns. Here are some of the facts that I've gathered. Pre and post pandemic profit margin averages in the food and beverage retail industry have gone up significantly on average from 1.62% to 2.85% respectively. A year-over-year -year comparison shows that consumer food prices have increased on average more, in fact, 3.7% more than the average price increase of a basket of consumer goods. Also, net income has more than doubled across the food and beverage retail industry as a whole, and we can find evidence in the reported net earnings of each of your companies. Loblaw's net earnings went from just over $1 billion in 2019 to $2.2 billion in 2022. And Empire Co.'s net earnings went from $387 million in 2019 to $746 million in 2022. In terms of sales volumes, we've seen evidence that the sales volumes uh, peaked or, or spiked at the beginning of the pandemic and then have been declining since. Uh, and lastly, you've increased your quarterly dividend payments to your shareholders. Jim Stanford has said, and I quote, if in fact the problem was all driven by supply shocks that supermarkets have merely been forced to pass on to consumers, there should have been a, a reduction in profits. And, I quote, to claim that supermarkets and other firms are innocent conduits merely passing on higher costs is empirically false. So Canadians want to know how you expect them to believe what you've said, which is that your profit margins haven't increased. And I think it's fair to say Canadians feel like the doubling of your profits has been literally at their expense. Something just doesn't add up here in my, in my view. Mr. Weston, to you, how do you explain the massive increase in net earnings of Loblaw, given the facts I've mentioned? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, we're very cognizant of the cost of food prices um, and their impact on Canadians all across the country. I see it. Uh, I hear it regularly when I'm, when I'm in stores talking to customers. Um, and I would uh, call into question, uh, you know, the analysis that you that you reference. Um, we look at our numbers uh, very, very closely all the time. Um, and, and I would just reiterate that our profit is one dollar on a twenty five dollar basket of groceries. Um, and if we invested 100 percent of our profits into lower prices, the price of a grocery basket would still be twenty four dollars. Okay. So as far as our profit, don't mean to cut you off, sure. but I, I so we have a difference of opinion and perhaps we're looking at different numbers given that are you willing to voluntarily submit your financial statements to the competition bureau to clear this matter up we have already submitted our financial statements to the competition bureau um, and uh, you know these are um, competitively sensitive um, you know pieces of data and so it's important that the competition bureau can see it they can understand it they can ask us follow-up questions but we would be resistant um, you know to disclosing that type of sensitive information on a public basis having said that in our financial disclosures um, you know we are a public company and we are held to the highest standard of transparency in our disclosures um, and so you can see very clearly that our one dollar of every twenty five dollars of grocery sales is in fact an accurate representation okay. of our results Great, thank you. Um, so my next line of questioning is for you, M Mr. Medline. Uh, for too long, large corporations have treated corporate social responsibility as merely a public relations exercise. And many of them have dedicated a portion of their profits to corporate philanthropy, which I, I think we all can admit does some uh, good in the world. But we also know that those who take their corporate citizenship and social responsibilities seriously are going much further in integrating these commitments into the DNA of their companies and making them central to the core of their business strategy. 
So, Mr. Medline, given your stated commitment to corporate social responsibility and sustainability, are you willing to do more to help Canadians in terms of changing your core business practices? And specifically, moving forward, are you willing to voluntarily give up a portion of the ballooning profits to help the average Canadian family uh, through deep, deeper discounts at the till? Hi, thank you. And a lot to unpack there. And if I don't get through it all, Mr. Turnbull, you can call me and we'll, we can talk about it more because there's a lot to come through. Um, we at Empire are unbelievably proud of where we've come on the ESG journey over the last number of years, especially on sustainability. We just put out a report on ESG, which is a pretty well state of the art and says how we're doing in great detail and the steps that we need to take to be able to be better at it. We're, um, we are, um, I think, generous philanthropists. Um, but uh, you can read the report and you can see everything we're doing on, on, in terms of treating our teammates. Some people call them employees, we call them teammates. Um, well, how we're doing in terms of governance and how we're doing on sustainability. Sustainability is driven from the board level down. It's one of our most important objectives. What I can tell you is in the last year, we have made sustainability and DEI objectives which are bonusable for um, our management at our company. But will you offer steeper discounts at the till? Let, let me just talk about that for a second. It's a great question. We um, at Empire, as you remember, um, as you may recall, not everybody knows perhaps, in 2017 we were in dire straits at Empire. Um, and um, we were making almost no money. We couldn't support our people, our stores, our communities. And over the last six years, through Project Sunrise and Project Horizon, we've started to turn around our company. We have one of the lowest um, um, earnings uh, profit margin in, in the world, and certainly the, one of the lowest in this country. Um, it, as, as somebody said here in their opening statements, I can't remember who, it would take almost nothing in terms of changing the, uh, our sales or our margin to tip us into a period, into a position of no profitability or, or less than that. Um, and we, we have done everything we can. We're doing everything we can promotionally. We're not passing on every price increase. We're fighting against price increases. Our flyers are more, are stronger. Our pack sizes are bigger. We're growing our private label business. We're doing everything we can to help Canadians. We're going to have to leave it at that, uh, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Medline. Thank you, Mr. Turnbull. Maintenant, Monsieur Parent pour six minutes. Ah, no, Mr. Parent, you have six minutes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to our three witnesses for being with us here today. We really appreciate your presence. I'll try to work quickly, and I'd like short answers just so we can make good use of my time. Mr. Weston, you have answered to Mr. Turnbull that you cannot publish your financial statements because, you know, it's a matter of confidence, a confidence issue and competition and so on. We certainly understand that. I can see the pile of papers before Mr. Singh. And, you know, we too have a lot of interactions with people and Canadians when we they see the types of figures that are coming out that show only overall profits. You know, the whole issue of pharmacy products, we were told about that in a prior meeting we've had with some of your colleagues, don't you think it would be better to be more transparent so that Canadians would be in a position to understand what your profit margins truly are, what you're saying is true? Isn't there some way to render something public without compromising your competition uh, situation? Could you provide this data to members of the committee, for example, so that we could have an overall view, even sending them to the legislative clerk of the House of Commons who could compile this and give some information to the committee about, you know, overall what's going on, give us some indicators that could allow us to make better recommendations to our government. Mr. Weston. For, for that question. Um, we do publish um, our financial statements, as I mentioned, on a, on a quarterly basis. Um, they are fully audited by, uh, you know, by an external auditor. Um, and that includes um, you know, our statements publicly uh, you know, when we release our results, where it's our responsibility to explain uh, in our documentation and uh, you know, in our analyst calls exactly what has driven uh, the financial performance of the business. And in those statements, we are very clear uh, and explicit about what is is driving the improved performance in the business, and those and those and those are real. You can take those to to, uh, to you know you can trust them. You can believe in them. They've been audited. 
No, no, I don't want to interrupt uh, because I'm uh, being implied. It's just that we have so little time. Okay, I understand. I understand that you have made comments on that. But when it comes to asking why your profits are up, well, we're always told by pretty much all grocers that it's the pharmacy products, pharmaceutical products, but we don't have that data. I think we're reasonable. I think we could deal with the figures, uh, taking good care of them and to being prudent in whom we share them with. But now I'm sending this message out to all three of you witnesses. Isn't there some way that you could gather that data in a certain form or another, um, you know, without necessarily under one banner, but let's say overall, then we, in our role of as parliamentarians who are here to protect the public and to tra manage information, we'd be able to make good use of that information. Are you open to that? The, the request, I don't know who requested it, but is studying this. And as I mentioned in the, my answer to the prior question, we have provided all of that appropriate information. So hopefully, um, you know, the output of that study will, will satisfy the committee. Um, but let me take it away. I'll, I'll look and see if there, you know, if there are other, uh, you know, if it isn't, um, you know, appropriately or sufficient for this committee, we'll try and find another way to provide the disclosure. I just would emphasize that um, you know we're obligated, um, you know, through the, the Securities Commission, um, you know, to speak the truth about these things. And so you can take what we say um, as the truth. Merci um, and, and maybe. Just Thank you very much. If if we are asked, um, you know, to disclose the origins of our of our financial results at that level of detail, then um, I would urge us to ask all others, um, you know, to do the same thing, whether it's Walmart, Costco, or um, you know anybody else. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, you, want me to, you said all three. Do you want me to answer or no? Short? Okay. We're very different at Empire Company. We have a very small pharmacy business. When you look at our numbers, you're seeing 90% grocery. So you can take those figures and you can figure out what we're doing in terms of sales margin profits. I think you have the idea. Okay. But if all three of you could provide a maximum of information to the committee, just find a way to do it, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Lafleche. to you, the 2% profit margin. Ms. Rood uh, went into detail about the fees uh, and so on that are uh, being imposed, and I won't get into the details to not waste time there, but the 2% profit margin, do you calculate into that the fines, fees, chargebacks, and so on that uh, you are charging? Is that included? Votre microphone, uh, Monsieur Le. Your microphone, please, Mr. Lefleche. The sounds. Uh, I think it's the the clerk. Uh, en réponse. Uh, so, an answer to you, Mr. Perron. Yes, our re uh, profit margin, our revenues, income includes all our fees. There's nothing hidden. Everything is transparent and negotiated ahead of time with our suppliers. Nothing is hidden, and all our uh, fees and costs are there in our income. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the other two witnesses have undertaken to work toward a um, code of conduct. I imagine you do as well. Yes, we are working on a code which will be managed by the players, by the sector, by suppliers and wholesalers. I think that that can certainly work well. There's a lot to be done, but we're actively involved in preparing that. Again, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. So little time. So that being the case, my concern is, and concern that other members of the committee has have as well, given that we haven't any information about what's going on in that negotiation in your sector, we're worried that it might become a symbolic code that would allow the sector to say, okay, this is great, slap each other on the back, we've got this lovely code, and so on. And I'm not trying to um, be critical here, but just trying to look reality in the eye. So do you undertake to ensure that in such a code there will be uh, provisions about, you know, these uh, types of fees and chargebacks and things that have been mentioned? You know, you've got a supplier working with you who has a perishable good of the sort that Ms. Rood brought up. They've got very little leeway then. They can't really negotiate much. They're going to lose this produce in any case. So this could look like a dominant position that you would have with them in such situations. And again, this is not a, an accusation or anything. I'm just trying to understand what goes on. Do you think that in such cases there should be uh, some party designated to deal with fees and things like that and fines, try to you know, put a bit of order in all of this? Um, you're running out of time, Mr. Parent, but Mr. Lafleche, if you would like 
to answer. You've got about 30 seconds. I'll give you that. Here's my answer then. Well, the whole idea of the code would be to increase transparency in matters of negotiation between suppliers and retailers. So that's indeed what we'd be doing. Thank you very much. Mr. Singh, uh, subbing in on behalf of Mr. McGregor, and let me go on the record saying, Mr. Singh, you've got big shoes to fill. Mr. McGregor is one of our, our good parliamentarians, so uh, over to you for up to six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to set the stage. My question goes directly to Mr. Weston. Right now, we're not just going through unprecedented period of cost of living crisis. We have families going into your stores, looking at the price of items, looking at them and putting them back because they can't afford them. We have families that are struggling to buy food for their kids in this country, in a G7 country. And they look at you and they see you making record profits. How could you justify that when families are struggling to put food on the table for their kids? Thank you. Um, you know, we feel uh, and understand that um, 95 percent of Canadians are concerned about food prices. Um, but grocery chain profits um, are not the reason for food inflation. And as I mentioned... Profit is too much profit. Well, so a company needs some degree of profit. Um, Record you know, profits more than you've ever Mr. made? Singh, ever? I'm gonna, Mr. Singh, I'm going to stop you there. Of course, your time is your time. And I can appreciate that. But we've invited, in fact, we've summoned these witnesses to come here. You ask a question. All, every member of this committee is expected to be able to hear the response. Sir, and I need you to certainly be a little bit more mindful of making sure that is. I know it's your time, and I'll give you that discretion. But please don't cross lines here. So back to you. How much profit is too much profit? You're making more money than you've ever made. How much profit is too much profit? We're a big company, and the numbers are very large, uh, but it still translates right down to the bottom line at $1 per $25 of groceries. And if you consider our growth, growth in profit in 2022 is 25 times lower than the unprecedented increases in costs that are being faced by the industry and by the world. And the fact that we have lower food price inflation in Canada uh, than in so many other parts of the world world is in part due to the high functioning of our food system here and in part to the, the, to the meaningful sure. effort that is being made by the grocery store industry um, to keep prices as low as possible. With respect, Mr. Weston, you've mentioned this $1 per grocery bit. We can put a fact in front of you. Your company is making $1 million a day in excess profits. No one feels sorry for your profit margin when you're making a million dollars, not just in profit, in excess profit a day at the same time that Canadians are experiencing the most unprecedented inflation in their lives. How can you look a family in the eyes and tell them that that's okay, what you're doing is okay? I had a, a conversation with a customer in a store just the other day. Um, she came to me and she said something similar. She said, how can you have such exorbitant profits? And I sat down. I didn't sit down with her, but we chatted uh, for about 15 minutes. And I explained, um, you know, what I'm explaining here to the committee. And she, she understood. Um, and she said, she said, OK, I didn't realize that. That's not the way it's being characterized, um, you know, when I read the Globe and Mail or whether I re when I read the Toronto Star. And I, and I said, yeah. I, I said, look, I, I'll I can tell you um, is that these this is the truth this is what what's going on and if we invested uh, if we didn't raise retail prices as costs went up um, we would the companies that we operate um, would disappear um, almost uh, almost I instantly um, and that's why this point about low profit margins is so important a hundred percent of the total profit of the industry could go into lower food prices and the price of a grocery basket for that customer who I spoke to would own, would still be twenty four dollars, and that's not to say that? it's not important. But it, it but our our ability to to affect this change is limited. That's why we need all to How work do you square together. that? How do you square what you're saying with the fact that you're you're experiencing unprecedented profits while people are struggling? How do you square that with the record bonuses that you and and your colleagues are receiving? How do you square that with the excess profits that you're making per day? How do you square that with the record profits you're making year over year? How do you square that? It doesn't add up. Mr. Weston, people, I've got 2,000, more than 2,000 people who submitted questions saying we are struggling while you're making these record profits. That explanation does not give any solace to the people that I've heard from at all. 
Well, I, I understand how difficult it is for so many Canadians, and that's why we're taking decisive action within the constraints of what uh, you know we're actually able to influence. We stopped five hundred million dollars of unjustified cost increases, um, you know, in our organization. We offer the lowest prices in the market in our discount stores like No Frills and Maxi. Uh, no Frills is recognized as having the most trusted prices in in the country. We ad match uh, in our large store formats on every single ad that is available in the market. Market so the customers don't have to shop around from one store to another to make sure they get the best that, value. That we are fix actively the losing money on core commodities, um, you know, milk, vegetable oil, butter, uh, certain cheeses, um, and all kinds of items in every single every every day of the week. So we are working hard on behalf of Canadians. You, you've still not been able to answer this basic question. Then, when a family that's struggling right now looks at your profit, you know, how much profit is too much profit? How much is enough? Like you are making more than you've ever made ever, ever, and you're not. You've not contradicted that point because we know it's true. How much profit is too much profit? At a time like this, when Canadians literally are saying that they are struggling, how much is too much then? Like for, for you, is there no limit to how much profit you can make? A success. That, that at the, on the backs of Canadians that are struggling because they can't afford the groceries? There's no limit? Reasonable profitability is uh, is an important part of operating a successful business. Um, I think at a dollar out of twenty five dollars of sales, that's reasonable profitability, and it's worth mentioning. You know, big numbers. Um, you know, in large enterprises like ours, I, you know, let's say our profit, um, you know, was in and around one point nine billion dollars last year. Very big number. Over two billion dollars is going to be reinvested back in this country, back into supermarket or back into new stores, new infrastructure, to creating jobs. It's not just about profit; it doesn't go to me. It goes the it goes back into this country. Um, so if you have reasonable, so last question, if you have reasonable for, profit no, levels, actually, and you gentlemen, have, and sorry, you, we're going to have to leave it there. I'll let you finish your your thought, Mr. Weston. Unfortunately, we're at time, Mr. Singh. I even gave you a few extra seconds to to try to make sure that was finished, Mr. Weston. If you'd like to finish out that thought. Uh, and then we're going to move on to the next round. I would, I would simply say that our profit levels are reasonable um, and we are working hard to lower prices for Canadians in every way that we can. And the profit that we do generate, we reinvest back in this country uh, to create more stores, more services and more jobs. Thank you. We're now going to turn uh, to our second panel. Uh, I have Mr. Barlow for up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And again, thanks uh, to our witnesses uh, for being, being here today. Uh, and you know, thanks to the leader of the NDP for for uh, being present at the, at the Agriculture Committee. But uh, I, I do find it interesting. Um, many of the recommendations that we've had from previous witnesses as part of the study have said uh, part of the reason for food inflation is uh, inflationary. Unfortunately, the leader of the NDP is completely complicit uh, in those policies which are helping to drive up the costs of food. So I'm I'm finding it interesting that he's here today to uh, to uh, try and fight this thing, but he's he's part of the problem. Um, but to, to the witnesses, um, you had mentioned about the uh, the grocery code of conduct, and I do find it interesting that we had Mr. Uh, McCain here yesterday, and his comments were that it's really not going to have a lot of, of teeth uh, when once this is in. And certainly maybe from your perspective, without having Costco and Walmart, um, I didn't even think of Amazon, uh, as participants in that grocery code of conduct, um, you, you know, do you... Do you believe that will it will have some validity or some um, uh, some pressure for for the grocery stores to to start to to be more transparent and and uh, yeah go ahead Mr. Mr. Medline first thank you thank you uh, Mr. Barlow for your questions and your interest I think unless we get everyone signed up it'll be a farce and I think we can get everyone signed up and I think we need the, the help of the government to be able to do so Mr. Weston. Yes. Um, so the code of conduct um, will can be a very positive, uh, you know, part of uh, of the industry, but it has to be um, developed in a in a fair and uh, and balanced way. Um, and we're actively contributing to the conversations that are, uh, you know, hopefully going to going to get us there. Sorry, and I don't want to forget uh, Mr. Lafleche. Um, sure. So. The more, the more participants, the better. Uh, we're confident that uh, most industry players will, will uh, participate in the code. So I can't speak for other companies, but we all, we all agree that the code uh, will benefit from broader participation. And I guess, um, Mr. Medline, you were, you're quite uh, uh, 
forceful on this, and I appreciate uh, your passion on, on the Grocery Code of Conduct, but um, you were mentioning about the transparency. This will allow more transparency on, on the fees and, and uh, fines, for example. Um, why do you think a Grocery Code of Conduct is needed to, to do that? Uh, wouldn't, can't the, the grocery chains do that on their own and, and be transparent with the, the fines and, and fees that they charge the, the farmers, for example? doesn't appear so. Uh, I, I, I wasn't uh, in the grocery industry until six years ago, just over six years ago. I was in the... Decision. Yeah, I, I didn't I, think you'd have to be here. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great business, but, uh, and I get to see Parliament for the first time since I was a little kid, so I'm happy <laughs> about that. But um, it's a serious matter, and, and, you know, I came over from hard goods and soft goods <clears throat> industry, and where there were, where people would work together. They'd work together to have more innovative products, to take costs of the system, to serve the customer. And I came over to grocery, and I was shocked at uh, at how the how the interactions were and how the friction between uh, what I call them supplier partners, but people call them vendors, and between the retailers. And I think it's hurting the industry. It hurts um, the trust in the industry. I'm all for fair, tough bargaining and negotiations. I'm not for unfair negotiations. And so, yes, I was outspoken on this issue because, you know, it was bothering me. Yeah. And I, you know, that was two and a half years ago. Um, I think we're headed in the right place. I think everyone's intentions are right. Um, the supplier partners um, are behind it. Um, we're getting more and more retailers behind it. And okay. just ask the government, please help and keep yeah. boosting it. Thank you. I guess I would ask um, all three of our witnesses here, and, and I, I think, with as Mr. Turnbull said, we we should have try and get compel Costco and, and Walmart to be here. Um, I would ask all three of our witnesses here um, if you would table with the committee uh, the list or the schedule of fines and uh, chargebacks and fees that you charge the suppliers. Uh, I believe that would help us in, in the work that we are we are trying to do. So I would ask uh, that you would uh, that you would do that. Uh, to, to Mr. Weston, you mentioned about uh, the information on the, that you provided to the Securities Commission. We do understand from the Competition Bureau yesterday that, or on Monday, they are uh, beginning a study on this issue specifically. When you provide that uh, the, your your economics uh, your numbers to the Securities Commission, is it broke and to the Competition Bureau? Is it broken down to as you mentioned, you're seeing some some growth in those areas that are outside of the food business, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, clothing, you know, what, uh, what other products you'd be making. Are those numbers broken down when you provide that um, uh, confidenti confidentially to the Securities Commission and the Competition Bureau? No, no our, our uh, financial results uh, and our financial disclosures are public um, and, uh, and you can see them, the, the, uh, the Securities Exchange can see them. Um, as they are published. I think the point I was trying to make was simply that um, we are held to a standard of accuracy. Um, they have to be accurate. They have to properly represent what's actually going on in the business and the comments and the color that we provide also need to be accurate. And so when we provide the color and commentary that we do, both written um, you know, and in, in verbal statements, they can be relied upon as accurate. And that's, that's all I'm um, you know, uh, in, in emphasizing for the committee. Mr. Barlow, unfortunately, oh, we're at time. Thanks, Mr. Gave, I'm trying to be generous because of the nature of this uh, this meeting and, and the fact that we're all trying to get the information. But uh, uh, we are at time. I will go, now go to Ms. Taylor Roy uh, for up to five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to Mr. LaFleche, Mr. Medline, and Mr. Weston for being here today. Um, this, um, I, I don't have all of the emails printed out from uh, the constituents with the concerns I've received, um, as I'm a bit of an environmentalist. Um, but I would say that my question will really be about the impact that this has had on consumers um, and on your employees or team members, as you like to call them, Mr. Medline. Um, and I, again, I won't go through all of the, the facts and the data given on your, how your profits have risen, um, because I think you recognize that and it's been pointed out many times. However, you talk about reinvesting those profits and um, you talk about building more stores, um, and we've seen that there have been increases in dividends to shareholders. Um, and while I don't fault corporations having a business background for maximizing shareholder value, I would think at these times that you could be reinvesting profits in different ways that might benefit um, Canadians who are struggling to make ends meet and to help those team members that work so hard on the front line. 
Um, and one of the things that we noticed was how the hero pay was um, reduced um, by all, um, basically by all um, grocery stores at the same time. And the freeze on no-name products was um, removed. And this was in the face of growing profits. So I'm wondering how these complaints or these concerns from our constituents, from Canadians, in the face of your growing profits can be reconciled with those facts and what you can do to address those concerns. And uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Medline, you can start. Yeah, thanks, and, and thank you very much for the question, Ms. Taylor Roy. Appreciate it. I'm going to try to unpack this. Um, you, t you talk about the team members, and it gets me a little bit because I think they're on the front lines as they have been for now, three years. Uh, they had to face uh, the pandemic, then they face inflation. And, you know, a family is trying to feed themselves and, 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 and the ends are tight because the mortgage payments are tighter because interest rates going up. Grocery is more expensive. They, they don't care about food supply chain and all the other niceties we talk about. It's tough. And our team members are on the front line and they're getting blamed. And, and I don't blame the people blaming, and it's, but it's tough on our team members. So thank you for saying that. Um, you know, and, and I do think that business is balanced and you have to, I always talk about, you know, Mr. Singh, you talked about how much profits or too much profits, but you have to make profits, but you have to make profits with values. And that might be different. We might have difference of opinion in that, okay? And, we, and what, what that means. Uh, but, you know, I do think that most companies are a certain kinder capitalism than it used to be. And maybe capitalism for some people is a dirty word. I think it's good as long as it's kind in their values. Um, we in, investing and balancing things, making sure people are treated fairly. But the capex we put in, we're putting over eight hundred million dollars in this year. Creates jobs, constructing stores, more people have jobs, more people have better paying jobs, and dividends are not a bad thing in my books. Okay, because um, a lot of people when they retire have pensions. A lot of it, a lot of people in this country, and we have to do, make some profits and pay some dividends so that they have something to retire on. So it's all balance. I can see some companies that are buyback shares. I think it's good. I think sometimes companies go too far and they don't balance it right. Our, our jobs I, and CEOs sorry, are balanced, really. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I'm sorry yeah. to interject, but time no, is short. No, so that's I do great. Want to hear Thank you. The other witnesses, but yeah. um, I'm not sure that balance is being met right now. As I mentioned, the two dollar decrease in the hero pay, the the um, the removal of the freeze on no-name no products in all of the stores when consumers are still struggling with food prices. So, oh, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. You're still talking. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I, I've heard maybe now because a, a time is tight, Mr. Weston, you could comment on that and what more could be done to address these concerns. Yeah, maybe I can comment on on uh, on the no-name price freeze. It was uh, specific to our enterprise. Um, it was part of an ongoing effort. Um, you know, something that we've been doing for months before, and that we continue to do today um, to deliver value to customers. Exactly, I think, in the spirit of what you're asking, uh, that program was real. Um, it saved customers uh, close to forty-five million dollars over three months. And if you look inside in in our public disclosures uh, that you can see from from our fourth. quarter, Quarter, you can actually see the impact um, of that investment and other investments on our overall gross margins as an enterprise. So why move it then? When well, inflation, so, yeah, when prices, so it was, profits are going up, yeah, inflation no, it's, is still so, high. Why so, move that? So we, so we didn't remove it. Um, what we did was we, we announced that we were going to do it for three months over the holidays. It was our belief at that time that for consumers, having price certainty um, over the holidays would be the most important thing for them. As we come out of the holidays, um, you know, there are other things that are more important to customers. They want deals. They want to be able to go places and get the best possible prices. So we took that investment, part of that investment, and are reinvesting it in lower prices um, and new uh, market lows. Uh, you know, so we're beginning to see key items actually going backwards. So there are all kinds of things that we do on a day in and day out basis. The price freeze was one of them and it's we're not finished. We continue No, on. I understand, but respectfully profits have been going up significantly however you look at it, whether you want to look at margin numbers and whether you want to look at what segment, but they have been going up but it would seem to me that there was room to actually keep the price freeze in place, not increase those prices while having the promotions and the other things you're talking about. Um, but I would also like to hear from Mr. LaFleche on this briefly as well. So we're at time, um, okay. but, but uh, in, uh, in trying to make sure that we hear from that witness, I, I have no problem giving some discretion. Mr. LaFleche, if you'd like to answer the question. Um, 
Uh, revenues have gone up. Expenses have gone up. Margins have not gone up. They've been stable for a long time, and food margins have actually declined. So that those are facts. Um, we uh, we work extremely hard. All our teams do to provide value to our customers every day in all of our banners. We have very competitive prices, very compelling promotions, uh, full uh, range of private label products. So again, we work really hard to deliver value to our customers, and the. Those are just, just facts. Thank you, Mr. Leroy. Uh, maintenant, Monsieur Parron, pour... Ah, no, Mr. Parron, you have two minutes and 30 seconds, more or less, sir. Thank you. Look, well, I'll go back over what was mentioned a little earlier, and I'm going to once again ask the CEOs with us here today to provide all the figures they're able to with uh, precise breakdown and we will treat them respectfully, perhaps based on some agreement we can come to with the um, House Clerk. We were certainly willing to um, take your word on profits, but we'd like to see some figures. And when the Canadians see figures that are higher than they were prior to the pandemic, and we've got an 11% food price inflation compared to a six point something inflation overall, um, you know, headline inflation. There's something going on in this sector. We'd like the information. Another matter now. You've all mentioned that you would like to see a grocer's code of conduct. I have said that I have some concern that it might be merely symbolic. Good on paper, but not good in reality. Would you be willing to evaluate such a code a year after it would have been adopted to see how it's going? Quickly, Mr. Weston, st to start, perhaps. Happy to, uh, to answer. So um, we are continuing to work on that code of conduct. As I mentioned before, um, the idea is to create the right form of transparency, um, fairness uh, on all sides. Um, and so would we be prepared? May I don't want to be impolite, but I have so little time. So, would you ag agree to reviewing the code one year after it would have been brought in? Um, and then we can decide how to soon. evaluate it. Yes, but would you be open to that? Would you be open to that idea? And perhaps Mr. Medline? Mr. Laflesh, how about you? Would you be open to reevaluating a code, reviewing it after it would have been brought in a year after? I think that it's a good idea once a code would have been applied to watch it change. It would take time to get it quite right in our sector. And as I say, such a code would be managed by industry players. So people in the sector would evaluate developments and uh, the precision of the code and so on. Thank you for your answer, Mr. Laflesh. Mr. Weston, earlier you said that your market is not an oligopoly. However, five companies control 90 percent of the market. I think that sounds like an oligopoly. I'm just looking at it from the outside. I may be wrong, and you're welcome to correct me, of course. But how can we explain what Ms. Taylor Roy has just underscored to the effect that salaries were dropped across the board by everyone at the same time. I'm happy to believe whatever you have to say, but looking at it from the outside, it looks like an oligopoly. Um, yeah, so if, if the, the question on, on pandemic pay, um, we introduced pandemic pay uh, as during a period of extremely abnormal uh, you know, conditions for frontline workers in grocery stores. Um, and we believed it was at our, our, at our, um, at our uh, encouragement, um, and it was our decision to bring that forward. No, um, you know, no parliament asked us to do it. Um, you know, no industry code of conduct asked us to do it. We made that decision Je because we felt it was the right. Sure, sure, I, I, I get that. I understand that. But here's the question: How do you explain that that changed across the board all at once, at the same time, unless there had been some discussion among grocers? I mean, you know, that's what Canadians are wondering. You look at it from the outside and we say, well, clearly they decided together. But I certainly know that um, we made that decision independently. Um, and, you know, that was that was the right decision at that time. We're at time, Monsieur Parron, but uh, I will allow Mr. Medline or Mr. Lafleche to respond to your question, if you'd like, and then we will move on to the NDP. La traduction est très faible. I'm very sorry. The translation isn't very loud. Um, it sounds as though the interpreter is far from me. Those involved in the translation, uh, can you hear me better now, Mr. Parron? And I speak. Same you. Same you. Okay. Yes, it is better. Thank you. Line, if you'd like to just respond quickly and to Mr. Lebel. I'm proud we paid Hero Pay. Um, we weren't asked to. Um, the uh, some of the other retailers mentioned in this room that you want to hear from did not pay it. Maybe you should ask them. And we mm -hmm. 
we said we would keep it in as long as there were lockdowns and that we would bring it back if regions locked down. After that, elite regions did lock down and we kept paying hero pay. So I'm proud of that. Mr. LaFlash, if you'd like. When the economy opened up again, we uh, removed the hero pay. We work in a very competitive market here in Canada, so we needed to work uh, along with the other players and work at the basically keep in line with them. Uh, to two and a half minutes. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, before I go to my questions, I wanted to ask um, to propose a unanimous consent motion to extend the time to hear from the witnesses to the completion of our time in this committee, and perhaps the work of committee can go to uh, another day. Uh, if I can put that motion forward for unanimous consent. We, uh, you can certainly bring it forward. Uh, I do know that this committee uh, has other work that we were intending. I know you're not a permanent member, but uh, I'll leave it to uh, to other committee members to decide. Yeah, Mr. Chair, respectfully, um, we haven't heard from the others from Walmart and Costco, and until we do so, by respect to the witnesses, I mean it's only fair that we've known this committee business was going to this meeting was going to happen. So it's not just about we can call back the witnesses if we need to. But before I hear from Costco and Walmart, um, I think it's only fair to the witnesses that we agreed to 115 because we do have a draft report to, to, to finish. And with respect to Mr. Singh, I, I, I respect the, propo the proposition that is being made, but we also have a committee uh, report that we need to submit to the House before uh, we get going. So. Okay. So unfortunately, that's not the case, but uh, Mr. Singh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weston, you mentioned that you had a conversation with one person for 15 minutes. I have uh, 2,000 plus people that have submitted questions. Will you undertake to respond to these questions? I'd certainly be delighted to, to have a look at them. I get feedback um, and, you know, I don't know if there are similar volumes. I don't want you to just have a look at them. I want you to respond to I don't know if there them. are similar volumes of email that I get, uh, you know, regularly inside Loblaw and I respond to them on a case by case, on a person by person basis. And <laughs> so it's more than just one, uh, you know, one individual. Sir, I'm asking if you would respond to these questions that I'm going to table to this committee. Will you respond to these questions? I, I'd certainly be happy to take a look at them. So you're not going to respond to the questions? No, I said I'd be happy to take a look at them. And, uh, and I didn't ask you to take a look at them, though. I said, will you respond to these questions? That's an important question. If you're not going to, just say it. If you are, that's an important thing to hear. I would like to take a look at them um, and, you know, determine, uh, you know, what the most appropriate form of response is. Okay, so you're not committing to responding to them. Uh, I would like to t table these questions uh, to, the ch to the committee. Mr. Chair, so I have them here and uh, I want to table this to the committee. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that a reasonable profit was, was something that a, a company should have, be able to make a reasonable profit. Uh, do you think a million dollars in excess profits a day is reasonable? It, it, um, it's a big number. Um, especially if it you is. multiply it over the course of 350, uh, 356 days. Um, but the, the math is still the same. The math is that on the top, on, on a very, very large sales base, um, that translates into, um, a, I think it's a, a 13 cents um, of uh, that incremental profit represents about 13 cents on a $25 grocery basket. And I would just reiterate um, that the cost, like we're in unprecedented times, um, global food price inflation grew 25 times faster than profits. Um, that to me is a, is a reasonable fact-based proxy for an industry that is not um, taking so advantage just understand of and you think a million dollars in excess profits, not normal profits, in excess profits a day that your corporation is making with you as CEO is reasonable profit? I don't agree with your characterization of excess profits. Um, I'm giving you the facts. Well, it's not and my character. This is the report from, from a professor. I disagree with the characterization of the report from the professor. We're going to um, leave it at that, gentlemen. I described. Uh, we're at time, and, and indeed, Mr. Singh, I, I was generous in giving you a few extra minutes, uh, a few extra seconds to finish that thought. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Thank you, Mr. Singh. We're going to turn to our final round of questioning. I'm coming back uh, to the Conservatives. Mr. Steinley, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the things from a producer side. I grew up on a dairy and beef farm, and I look at what people are getting at the farm gate to what prices are in stores. And most of you commented that 
input costs have gone up. So I wanted to ask the question of, are you talking about input costs for producers have gone up and thus you've had to pay more for goods? Because uh, Mr. Weston, you, you used that specifically, that comment, uh, fuel costs have gone up, input costs have gone up, energy costs have gone up, and labor costs have gone up. So can you kind of break that down? And I'll get to my next question later, but just kind of break that down a little bit for your input costs. I think that was Mr. Medline who, who said that. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Medline. Okay. Um, well, I'm just looking at, I mean, pretty well every single input cost you could have in business has risen over the last, let's say, 17 or 18 months, everything. I couldn't find anything that's gone down. So I'm just looking at the less than the last three years, butter up 59%, corn oil up 140%, wheat up 109%, flour up 63%, turkey frozen 70 up, 78% up. Then you go to packaging, tin up 53%, pulp up 45%. I'm not gonna keep going on. Freight, fuel, labor, every Thank input you. cost has gone up. The price sir. of business is going up. Yeah. So from the Canada Food Price Report in 2023, I'm gonna read this quote and I'd like you all three of you to comment on this. By 2030, a typical 5,000 acre farm could see taxes of over $150,000, which would comprise the owner's ability to make a profit. The added cost of a carbon tax will increase production and transportation costs associated with food and may be passed on to the consumer as producers try to remain profitable." End quote. My question is, you've talked about the global phenomena of food price inflation, but how much have government policies led to the increase in price increase of food price like the carbon tax and possibly like the fertilizer reduction and that's going to make the price of food go up. Uh, okay, I'd be, I'll, I'd be happy to, uh, to start. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I can't comment, um, you know, with any real precision on what the government policies, uh, you know, have been and the impact that they've had on uh, a manufacturer or a grower's, uh, you know, um, uh, cost of doing business. Uh, I know in our case, um, you know, for example, with, uh, with milk, our most popular dairy skew, we sell below cost every single day. Um, and so wherever those costs are, um, you know, they're coming up, they're being pushed up, um, and they are certainly not being captured inside our grocery margin. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. LaFleche? Well, there's no question that uh, input costs for producers have gone up way up over the last uh, several months, uh, and their costs to us have gone up, and that's this whole supply chain and why food inflation is up like we've been saying since, since the beginning. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's for us to comment on which government policies have had an impact on those input so, costs. So you're telling me- those producers. Yeah. That, so you're telling me a government policy that increases the cost of fuel, like a carbon tax, isn't adding to the cost of you doing business and adding to the increased price of food? I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's not for us to comment on which government policies are having which impact on their producer costs, but clearly the, their costs are up. What the, what the exact root causes of those, of those uh, input costs are, are leave to others. I'll leave to other experts. Uh, Mr. Medline, any comment? Yeah. Eric, I'm, I'm not a politician. Anything, there are so many actions that increase the cost of goods. So anything that happens that puts a cost on will increase the costs uh, to consumers and will hurt farms. Obviously, it's up to the government to decide and balance, just like we have to do in our businesses. You have to balance which of those costs are worth it and which are not. Thank you. I have one last question. I have um, a minute left, so I wonder if each of you could take a swipe at this one. If you guys are doing business fairly and openly and transparency and tra transparently, why would you guys need a grocery code of conduct? Um, so we do try our best um, you know to do business in a fair and transparent way we believe that we do business in a fair and transparent way 99% of the time um, it's you know you should think about what we do we buy products and we sell them um, and you know we negotiate with the people who sell us the product for the lowest possible prices that can lead to tension um, you know those tensions despite the best uh, sort of will in the world uh, you know can perhaps lead to bad judgment bad judgments on both sides as an example I think we've commented on this we've seen a number of what we would consider to be unjustified cost increases that have been put through uh, or requested by vendors over the last uh, you know number of months so it's really important important that any code or any, um, you know, set of practices that we engage in are properly balanced. 
Um, from our perspective, we are implementing changes today uh, based on feedback that we get from vendors, uh, you know, to improve that transparency regardless of whether we have a code of conduct. Um, if we have one and that one works uh, effectively for all sides, that's terrific, but it won't stop us from changing our policies and programs to minimize those incidents where poor judgment is used. Thank you, uh, Mr. Steinle. Rat time. I, I don't know if Mr. Medline or Mr. LaFleche wanted to weigh in at all, or uh, if not, that we can leave it at that. Very quickly, if you could. Yeah, I think that obviously transparency is really important, but what I did was when I came into the industry, I spent a lot of time talking to supplier partners, what some people, as I always say, say are vendors, and some of the stories I heard I didn't like, and I thought that the transparency wasn't working well enough, and I think that a code could help us all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll now turn to Mr. Jouin uh, for up to five minutes. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Chair. And I will share my time this last minute with my colleague, Mr. Turnbull. Women's Day, and I do want to thank all of the women who work for your businesses. I know they work hard. I get to meet them uh, not every day, but almost every day in, in your stores. Um, I think the issue we're talking about here is public trust and, and how do we provide public trust um, to consumers overall and f when we're dealing with food, uh, we, deal at it, we, we deal with it on the agricultural level and I, I want to start by saying that everybody deserves to make a reasonable profit from the farm level to, to the retailers, everybody deserves to make a reasonable profit. Where we face some issues is, um, and, and it's been mentioned by some of my colleagues, is um, a few years back, and I know some of you were, um, you worked with, with the Competition Bureau, but the, the whole issue about bread price fixing from 2001 to 2015, that caused a breach in public trust. And I think this is part of the reason why we're, we're here today. And, and I, I don't want to point, my goal here is not to point the finger at anyone. I just want to find solutions. And I don't think our committee is equipped to determine whether or not you're making an okay profit on a certain product or not. I think the Competition Bureau is the right place for this to happen. That being said, um, we, some of you have stated that you have provided financial statements. It's been said publicly by all of you, I believe, and that um, most of the profit margins or most of the profit has been on non-food products. My question is, um, and, and some of you has testified today that financial statements were provided to the Competition Bureau on a voluntary basis, because I believe Minister, the Minister of In Innovation and Science and Economic Development back in May 2022 wrote a letter to some of you to say, to ask the Competition Bureau to look at this. Is uh, the, the, the statements that you have provided, is the Competition Bureau going to be able to determine the difference between uh, profits on food items versus non-food items. And I would start, and I'm just going to start with uh, with Mr. Weston, Mr. Medlin, and Mr. Laflèche uh, en ligne. Yes, certainly based on the submissions that we provided. If I can just comment very briefly though, we're focusing on, I know I keep saying it over and over again, it's probably frustrating you, but this $1 is what we're focused on of the $25. And all of this time, effort and exposition is focused on that amount. No matter what is there, and there isn't anything of significance there, um, that isn't gonna change the cost of food. It's not gonna solve the challenge um, you know, for Canadians. So I would urge, you know, this committee, as long as it was, continues to operate, to expand, you know, its inquiry into the full value chain, uh, because it's just simply not mathematically possible for all this to sit in that one dollar, and that's, uh, you know, uh, you know, something that we we should collectively try to address. Fair enough. Thank you for your question. Yeah. You know, um, first, I'm just going to set the record straight. Uh, the Competition Bureau investigation into bread price fixing has been going on about eight years now. Empire Company did not fix bread pricing. I just want to be clear on that, okay? I think for us at Empire Company, the financial statement sort of red herrings. You get pretty well from our financial statements what they are. We provided all sorts of information to the Competition Bureau, I think, that is far more interesting um, and would and like to do that. So, I do so worry that... The, just, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry I'm going to run out of time. Will they be able to determine the profit margin? I don't need to know that, but will they be able to determine the profit margin from food products versus non-food products, and I think that's the main key. I, I question. hope they can. I've read the submission. Okay. If they can't, they should contact me. Thank you. I do want to say, though, I, I do you, worry we I'm lost just, trust. I'm going to run out of time, yeah. Monsieur Lafleche. Yeah. Vous avez. Uh,
Mr. Left Ash, 15 seconds to answer my question. My only question is the financial statements that you provided to the Competition Bureau, will they be able to tell from that the difference between food products and uh, non food products? Thank you for your question. Just a quick um, comment on the bread scandal. It is Metro has never been found to have uh, disrespected any competition legislation. Yes, with, with, full, with full respect, sir, I just need an answer to my question. I'm offended by the allegation that we uh, were involved in that scandal. As for the Competition Bureau, yes, we're providing the documents to them, and I will fully comply with whatever they request. I wanted to ask for a point of clarification. So uh, Mr. Singh here um, uh, asked to table a stack of questions to the committee. So one is uh, I want to clarify whether MPs can table evidence in committee. I didn't think that they could. Another question uh, for Mr. Singh would be if, uh, if he's provided questions in both official languages. I'm also interested to know whether he's got the consent of the individuals that he's disclosing questions uh, and whether there's personal information of Canadians being disclosed in those documents. And I think we have to be responsible uh, when, when considering uh, tabling evidence in committee. No, those are important points, uh, Mr. Turnbull. Obviously, it happened in the interaction. I know our clerk was looking into that. Um, uh, in the interest of this committee, I think uh, I'm going to let our clerk to continue to look into it. Um, it's ultimately, um, uh, I'll turn to you if you have an answer right now, Madam Clerk. If you don't, she's going to continue to look. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Turnbull. Just while I have the floor, I also would like to move a motion. Uh, that as part of the committee's study on food price inflation, the committee invite the following witnesses, Horatio Barbito, CEO Walmart Canada, and Pierre Riel, uh, Senior Vice President, Country Manager, Costco Wholesale Canada. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Turnbull. Um, colleagues, uh, thoughts on that in terms of uh, the idea of inviting uh, some of the CEOs? I see, uh, I see Mr. Singh supporting Mr. Uh, Paron. I presume, of course, you have the Liberal support uh, and Mr. Barlow as well. Okay, uh, that'll be moved then. Uh, Madam Clerk, I don't think you require anything else. It's unanimous consent that we will move that. You've got that. Um, colleagues, that brings us to the end. Uh, I do want to recognize there's a couple members of Parliament who have taken their time to, to be here on the committee. Mr. Epp from Leamington, Mr. Fragiscados uh, from the London area. I don't know the, your exact name or your exact writing. Uh, and, and Mr. Morris. Uh, Mr. Morris uh, sits with a party that is not recognized, uh, so they don't have status here. But with your permission uh, and in the interest of allowing him just a brief moment, I, as your chair, I would like to give him one or two minutes to just ask a question. Uh, I, I do believe I need unanimous consent, but this committee has always worked pretty good on consensus. Uh, do I have that? Okay. Mr. Morris, about two minutes, please. Well, let me start by saying thank you to those who believe our parliament can't function well. I think that was an example of, of functioning really well. So thank you to all committee members and to the, to the chair. I'll stop uh, using up time on thanks and, and turn to the executives who are with us. My question to you is trying to reconcile uh, recent earnings results a Loblaw, for example, quarter four brags about earnings increase of almost 13% over the previous year. And time and again throughout the last hour and a half, hearing each executive say, but our, our earnings are reasonable. Uh, can I have you each comment, yes or no, whether you would support an excess profit tax that has been called for by many, including Mr. Singh, here in, in the last hour? an excess profit tax above your regular profits, which you're now bragging about having uh, increased from, specifically so that the government of Canada could use that to reinvest in supporting the lowest income Canadians who are suffering from the cost of living crisis that we're in. Would you each comment on whether you support an excess profit tax, which would raise $4.3 billion over the next five years? Thank you. 
Uh, look, I certainly think believe that Canadians expect us to pay our taxes, um, to pay our fair share of taxes, and we do. Last year, Loblaw paid $850 million in tax. I've said this before. I think you have to do a, 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 the right definition of a windfall tax, um, you know, and then determine exactly who should pay it. Um, and when I go back to this point about looking at the entire value chain, um, if there is a windfall, um, then it needs to be assessed throughout the entire value chain not just at the end of the value chain, where, as I said before, there's one dollar of the total uh, you know, impact. Having said that, I do not believe that there are windfall profits um, you know, in the grocery industry today. I believe that what is impacting um, high prices for Canadians is a global cost of living crisis that affects folks all over the world, and that Loblaw is doing a very significant amount to ease the burden on Canadian consumers every single day. Mr. Morris, we're, we're going to, I think, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to let Mr. Medline answer your question and Mr. LaFleche, and uh, thank you for your intervention. I'll keep Mr. it brief, Medline. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Morris, for your question. Appreciate it. Um, without the details, it's a broad question to be able to answer. I'd like a bit more detail, but when I think about a windfall tax, I, I do get concerned that it would penalize companies that are rightfully improving their businesses the right way. I worry about unintended consequences always. And I worry that ad hoc taxes discourages investment in this country. Um, and I think we should be encouraging investment in our great country. Mr. LaFleche. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I disagree that there's any excess profit here. We, we make a reasonable profit and we pay full taxes on it, all of them in Canada at very different levels of government. So I don't think a, a, next, uh, a special tax on grocery would, would be constructive. Uh, it, it would probably reduce investment, reduce innovation, and, and not be fair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morris. Uh, colleagues, as your chair, I, I rarely get the opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to indulge uh, myself just very quickly on two ones uh, as I listen to the testimony here today. Um, Mr. Weston, you talked about how Loblaws has voluntarily provided uh, information to the Competition Bureau. Uh, Mr. Medline, I, I think you've acknowledged that uh, Empire has done the same in terms of providing information uh, to the Competition Bureau. Uh, we haven't heard from Mr. LaFleche. I would be interested in hearing from Metro's perspective. The one challenge this committee has had, and Mr. Drewen really touched upon it, is trying to delineate uh, the, the success and the profits of the various companies that are before us here today and the delineation as Mr. Weston, you recognize there's multiple lines of business. Met, Mr. Medline, you've mentioned that perhaps Empire's uh, additional businesses outside of food are not as significant perhaps as some of your competitors, but we as parliamentarians have difficult uh, in trying to get that access to information. We had testimony from the Competition Bureau that suggested that having uh, changing their legislation to actually allow them to compel information from companies of interest in these market studies would be a very um, important regulatory change. So I guess my question to all three of you, uh, Mr. West, I think you've uh, addressed it, perhaps Mr. Medline as well, is have you submitted information to the Competition Bureau that delineates the two? I think the two in the room have answered that. And then I guess my secondary question would be, are you open and willing to that proposal from the Competition Bureau to give them perhaps a little bit more regulatory pull uh, to compel information for market studies specifically. Uh, Mr. LaFleche, perhaps we can hear from Weston, or sorry, about from Metro, about whether or not you voluntarily provided to the Competition Bureau, and then I'll allow all three to answer the, the, the broader question. Thank you. So uh, we are participating in the Competition Bureau study. They have made certain requests. We will, we will take them all seriously and fully cooperate with them uh, in, in a normal way, uh, as long as it's... Uh, market-wide, competitive, and, and confidential, and that there's uh, no competitive disadvantage in doing so. So, as, as, as it was said before, and it's the same for us, we publish our results according to international financial reporting standards. They're fully audited. We provide color on pharmacy and, and food uh, to, to uh, explain our numbers, and we provide extremely detailed information quarterly with a lot of information annually. So, so there's a lot there for the public to see and for all members of the committee to see. But we will cooperate with the participate in the study of the Competition Bureau. Does your company have a, a perspective on the Competitions Bureau suggestion around giving them more regulatory powers to compel beyond your voluntary nature of, of how you're cooperating right now? Is that something that uh, you would support or do you need more time to reflect on that? 
Well, I, I would, we would need to see exactly what, what's asked or exactly what, what that entail and, and what that means. So I can't really comment. I'll take a note of it and, and we could get back to you. Mr. Medline. My response is, uh, is Eric. Mr. West. Yeah, I, I uh, feel very much the same way. Uh, and if the Competition Bureau isn't getting the information that they need from us, um, all they need to do is call us um, and let us know, and we'll be happy to make it available. Last quick point that I want to raise, uh, given we have the member from Leamington here and the greenhouse sector being so important in his riding. Uh, Mr. Medline, you, you mentioned uh, your company's deep roots in Nova Scotia as a, as a member of Parliament from Nova Scotia. I appreciate that. Uh, can I give you about 45 seconds to talk about your work in vertical farming? I know Empire has been involved and whether or not we as parliamentarians, you, you really mentioned one of your strategies or one of your thoughts on addressing uh, food price inflation is actually investing in the greenhouse sector, which I think is part of Canada's strategic interest, particularly in southwestern Ontario. Um, I'm going to give you just a moment to elaborate on anything else you might want to leave for us as parliamentarians, and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, w whenever we can, we want to buy Canadian. We want to buy local. We've increased our, increased our local uh, purchases, uh, you don't even know how many times, uh, over the last number of years. Um, it is a difficult business to greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas, green, <laughs> I've got greenhouse gas on the mine here, um, for, to farm out of greenhouses, um, that we've got to make it easier to have shorter supply chain. It, we have to buy Canadian support our farmers. We have to lower the price, not rely on others. But I think that the government should look at ways that we can help these companies. These are hard companies to start up. Unfortunately, we've seen some of them fail because they're very difficult. And we would love to support by buying these products as we do today, more and more Canadian, Canadian produce, which is obviously very difficult to get our hands on in uh, months like this. Okay, with that, uh, colleagues, uh, that brings uh, our questions and our opportunity with uh, the CEOs to a close today. We are going to be making a quick transition to those who are uh, on the committee uh, to continue our, our draft consideration of global food insecurity. Uh, on behalf of the members, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Medline, Mr. Weston, and indeed uh, Mr. LaFleche for joining us here today uh, and having the opportunity for us to engage with you. Thank you very much.